Welcome to Lickwick, San Francisco's Literary Festival. I'm Jack Bower. I'm the co-founder of Lickwick, and we are streaming live from the Bay Area and around the world. And it's like 95 degrees here. Uh, this is our 21st festival and our very first virtual one. And our schedule runs through October 24th. So we are halfway through our festival right now. You can catch all of the details at lickwake.org. Tonight, we are honored to be able to present the brand new book, The Coquettes. Acid Drag and Sexual Anarchy by, uh, by Fayette Hauser, um, published earlier this year from Process Media. Um, fascinating window into what the hell was going on in the 1960s in San Francisco. Uh, Fayette will be in conversation with original members of the Cockettes, Pam Tent and Scrumbly. Whoops, there it is, Scrumbly Coldwin. Ha. Ah. So uh, thank, thank uh, all of the Cockettes, uh, uh, past, present, and future for, uh, for being you and for contribu contributing uh, uh, acid drag and sexual anarchy to the San Francisco landscape. Many thanks to our co-presenters tonight, Dog Eared Castro, support your local bookstore, and the Bay Area Reporter. So uh, a few things before we begin, please feel free to ask the group a question at any time. There's a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Just click that, type in your question and send it, and we'll get to your questions in the second half of the event. Afterwards, after the event ends, you'll be asked to fill out a very short survey. Uh, please take a couple of minutes to do this if you can. There's only a few questions. We just want to get to know who you are and uh, find out what you'd like. And uh, also it helps us uh, try and raise money to continue the arts in San Francisco, one of the most expensive cities in the world. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. You can support uh, Fayette's book tonight by buying it at your favorite indie bookstore or uh, if you are not near your favorite indie bookstore, you can go to bookshop.org and uh, search for Lickquake, and we have an entire bookshelf of authors from this year's festival, and you can buy her book um, through there. We also ask for your support of the Lickquake organization to help us continue to do these events. The whole festival's free. That's kind of what we had to do this year. So, um, you know, even if you watch Netflix, it costs you a few dollars. So if you believe in keeping literature and books a key component of the cultural landscape in San Francisco, please um, drop us a few dollars if you can. You know, every bit helps. We accept don donations on Venmo at Liquake. You can go to PayPal and use info at liquake.org, or you can go directly to our website and donate through there at liquake.org. So let's get on with the show. Uh, the Cockettes. So if you don't know about them, you're going to learn an awful lot about um, how crazy the city was back in the day. They were birthed in an LSD bathed commune in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district in the summer of 1969. The Cockettes were a fever dream of sexual freedom and expression. They granted themselves names and identities that reflected their inner wild selves and then put it all on the stage with elaborate costumes and anarchic musical productions. Gay, straight, bisexual, pansexual, the Cockettes were a vital art collective in San Francisco and essential to the history of high drag. And they did this all at a, the Palace Theater in North Beach. So Cockette member Faya Hauser has put this book together to chronicle and catalog it. Uh, I, I understand that the publisher has used the phrase flamboyantly illustrated, and you're going to see some of those images tonight. And so, uh, as she shares images from the book, so let's uh, let's get to it. Uh, as John Waters had said, the cock about the cockettes, they were like hippie acid freak drag queens, which is always a good thing. Uh, the, so the people that you're going to meet tonight and hear from. Uh, I'll just describe them very briefly here. Sweet Pam, AKA Pam Tent, was a core member of the Cockettes throughout their heyday. After the group dispersed, she continued to perform with Pristine Condition and Paula Pucker and the Pioneers, and then later joined John Waters stars Divine and Mink Stoll on stage for shows at the Palace Theater in San Francisco. She then uh, went to New York and performed with a who's who of avant-garde at the time, uh, Warhol, 
people, members of the Whiz Kids from Seattle, and Dee Dee Ramone. That's right. She is author of the 2004 memoir, Midnight at the Palace, My Life as a Fabulous Coquette, which we were so lucky to have her at Lake Quake back in 2004. Uh, and now she lives in Santa Rosa, California. So Richard Scrumbly Coldwin is a musician, composer, conductor, and performer, and was one of the founders of the Coquettes. He is a mainstay of Bay Area showbiz. Ask anyone. He definitely has, he is, mainstay. Yeah, his post coquettes career has included uh, many appearances with his vocal groups, The Distractions and The Jesters, collaborations with theaters, including Rhinoceros, Berkeley Rep, and New Conservatory, and cabaret acts with people the likes of Cindy Goldfield and Lee Crow, AKA uh, Elvis herself. Uh, okay, and our author, Fayette Hauser, grew up on the East Coast and came of age with the blossoming with the fertile 60s underground. She is a graduate of Boston University College of Fine Arts with a BFA in painting and sculpture. In 1969, she co-founded the pioneering experimental theater group, The Coquettes in San Francisco. As one of the few treasured biological females in the Coquettes, she stepped out, showed off, got wild, and lived in Technicolor with the likes of the family dog, Janice Joplin, and Andy Warhol. She writes and lectures and travels, and she lives in Los Angeles. So please welcome Pam, Scrumbly, and Fayette. Hey, everybody. Hi. Take it away, Faye. Hey. All right. There we go. So, good evening, everyone. And uh, I hope you're ready for some fabulous pictures and some even more great stories. So, Scrumbly, let's kick it off with a little piano. And I'm going to read an excerpt from the book. The component we cockettes all shared, our group consciousness, firmly entrenched in the San Francisco zeitgeist, was the cosmic one. We considered ourselves freaks. The term freak had always been a derogatory one. It meant someone who was different, an alien in society, one who was shamed into isolation. All of us were aliens within our natal families in the society that we came from, the 60s early 60s, so straight, we couldn't stand it. But our level of self-realization allowed us to embrace our own uniqueness and to shed the yoke of shame allowed and allowed us to become the cockettes. We all shared this perspective gained via psychedelics. As artists, the freak consciousness was our specialty. This element set us apart and gave originality and individualism to our work. Hibiscus was the master freak, the shaman, our firecracker. And we all lit the fuse. He galvanized us into a group consciousness that was open, daring, inclusive, positive, life-affirming, shameless, and sacrilegious. And this was our personal vision. Our metier was high drag. We were what we wore and we wore a lot. We brought it all that we were becoming and creating at the time and we put it on the stage. Our lives on the stage became one. There we go. So here we are in front of the Hate Street house. And this is a uh, do you think this was 1970 or 71? No, we were at the hate 71. In 71, we moved to Oak, to Oak Street. Oh, this so is this 70. is 1970. Okay, yeah. and this is a Mary Ellen Mark photo of all of us. We had done a shoot with her, uh, which you'll see incredible pictures in a couple of minutes. So now it's not working. Oh, great. No, I'm okay. I'm, no. Oh, the screen share is not working. Oh my God. Yeah, it's working. I, Just scroll down. It's not moving. Nothing's moving. Oh, scrumbly. Oh, None of the buttons are moving. Okay. I'm going to stop the share. Can you, and... can you scroll the, uh, can you scroll when you get there? 
Let me get it. Jesus, I knew this was going to happen. Um, well, let's, while you're looking for, while you're looking. All right. Yeah. Why don't you play something, Scrumbly? Okay. Or Pam and I can talk about the Hate Street House. <laughs> okay. No, we oh, there we go. Now it's working. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So this is the Hate Street House. So, yeah. And there we are. This is a field that was next to the house. I'm sure that field isn't there anymore. Now there's backyard. Yeah. That's the backyard on Oak Street on the pan. Oh, on Oak Street. Okay. Let's see. And this is all of us. There you are, Pam, in the middle with Marshall <laughs> giving you a sexy look. And here's hibiscus. This is the shaman hibiscus. And here he is clearly on acid in Golden Gate Park. He's vibing with the baby. He's probably singing, fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly. <laughs> right. I don't know. I did a show with him in the park. He sang Tender Shepherd. And, oh, man. You know, he had a, quite a repertoire. <laughs> right. He was ready. I mean, he came to us with a vision, and we just said, let's go. You know, I've so never seen this picture of me. I'm just, I'm, it's, it's great. Yeah, this picture is part of the Mary Ellen Mark collection, and this is the front steps. Okay, so this, and here is Hibiscus in the Kitchen. So I, I'm going to read another tiny little excerpt, uh, because this is what Hibiscus would do in the kitchen. Making fresh bread was considered a ritualistic act, healing and meditative. All communes and houses had at least one bread maker. We had several. After all, what gay hippie doesn't know how to make bread? Anyone new who came to us would immediately be initiated into the cockett style by hibiscus, who occasionally made bread, but always told this story. Oh, come sit down and have some bread. It's my special cum bread. You see, I knead the dough very well, and then just when it's ready, I glaze it with my cum, and then pop, into the oven it goes. Shall I cut you a slice? Of course, this was the ultimate test. Would they laugh and stay and play with us, or would they run screaming down the stairs? As many times as I saw hibiscus make bread, I never actually saw him bless it with his special glaze, but it sure was a great icebreaker. And hibiscus was always in drag. This is like of a day. I drag in the kitchen. And here is John and Link. And you can see Scrumbly's arm handing them a joint. Ah. <laughs> right? There's your hand. Or something. Yeah. Okay, so this picture is also from Mary Ellen Mark. And there's something really unusual about this picture because behind John, you can see on, uh, I'm looking at the right, is Tahara. And then on the other side, you can see a figure. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a ghost. Because when I got the print, I took a magnifying glass because I couldn't figure out who that was. That is no one that was in the cockettes. <laughs> this is really, this is a Victorian woman. And she has her hair pulled back. And when I looked at the print, it, this is contrasty, but on the print, I could see she was in a Victorian striped summer dress. You could see the entire dress. And she's sitting there with a smile on her face because she's happy to be in the photo shoot, but she's not in any other shot. And she certainly wasn't a coquette. So there she is. That's the coquette ghost. <laughs> you sure wasn't roomy. <laughs> Right, he, climbed in the, he climbed in the back window and sat in the chair. No, that's our little, that's our favorite ghost. That was John in my, in my room at, uh, on Hate Street. I had, oh, really? This was your room? I had the loft up there. Oh, on Hate Street. Right, right, right. I always Hello. think of the piano, but that was on Oak Street. Yeah, the piano was in the dining room on, uh, or the living room on Hate Street. Right. So... Here's Prissy doing his makeup, fussing. Oh, look at Ocean. And there's little Ocean, yeah. And there's one of John's paintings. It's a painting of Tahara. So John seven. was a, a great painter. 1971. 71? 
yeah. 70. You can see how we loved our floor, 1940s floral drapes. <laughs> yeah, while they stayed up, you always made pants out of them. <laughs> right, right. Those in quilts. I would see these gorgeous quilts go into a pair of pants with the scissors. Oh, oh I God. made that quilting. That was that was my quilted velvet pants. Right. So, Scrumbly, this is your um, assemblage here. Okay, now, do you remember that mirror? The blue, had blue glass, yeah, Art Deco mirror. Do you remember that? From the Uptown Theater. Yeah. Do you know how we got that? Oh, we, I, we just took them off the walls. Yeah, we took them off the walls. They were in the ladies' bathroom, uh, in the ladies' lounge. So the Uptown Theater is the theater that uh, Hibiscus first found for us to perform in. And it was a porno theater. It was so falling apart. It was incredible. Um, but around Christmas, we decided to do the uh, wedding of Tina and Boop. Do you remember that? And Hibiscus made everybody wreaths and, and we went to the theater and we were on stage where everyone had their clothes off and we were surrounding Tina and Boop and doing like a magical dance with all wreaths on our heads. And the owner of the theater came busting in and ran up the aisle and screamed, you're gonna do a live sex show? And he threw us out. And on the way out, you and I took the mirrors because we thought, well, he doesn't deserve these fabulous mirrors. We should have them. And that's the story of those mirrors. Uh, well, my, my friends from uh, Alaska were living there at the time. They're in the Uptown Theater? Uptown Theater in the green room. Oh, my God. Yeah. That hip, place is really something. Hip and uh, Bloop were living there. Emerson Covello and his uh -huh. friend and uh, yeah other friends from Alaska, they had a band that I used to play organ in. That was the start of my shoe collection. Actually, it it graduated. Nikki sent me a hundred pairs of shoes from, uh, from one of his trips, like the death of a bank president's wife, and he sent me a hundred pairs of shoes. So wow. this escalated, this. I remember those black ones. They had gold studs. That's on right. The platform. That's right. Yeah, those were beautiful. Do you still have any of them? No. No. Oh my God. Too bad. I know. I haven't been able to wear heels for about five years. <laughs> I know. I can't wear them either. <laughs> those pictures. Here's in the, the sewing room. Yeah. Ah, the sewing room. Yeah. And here's Wally, just sitting around doing nothing with a whole lot of drag on. And this is John's room, I remember, because he had that was a red and white uh, yeah. quilt. quilt that was on the floor. Yeah. Wally sort of took Hibiscus's place with uh, the right. smell of drag when, yeah. hibiscus, when a Hibiscus took off. He sort of stepped in there to fill the void. <laughs> And this is Wally taking a nap before a show. You can see him on the floor. There's his legs and his buttocks <laughs> sticking out from his big headdress. Okay. And this is Marshall. He was the man of the house. A and real man. A real man. He was a real man. We had real men. Come on, you guys were real men. Well. He he had, he fathered a child and so did I. Right there you go. Now he was a carny. He worked in the carny before he was a cockette, uh, and he drove a motorcycle through a flaming hoop. And he was also a fire eater. So uh, Marshall would, you know, do it in his bed. He would eat fire in the bedroom. I would say you have to show me. And so he gave me a show one night. Here he is in his lounging in the bed. Uh, and he had a big orange, it was a huge bed with a big orange Art Deco painted canopy. And uh, this is where you found Marshall most of the time on his bed. He would say, uh, which, is, which is more daring to ride the motorcycle through a fire hoop or do drag on stage? <laughs> he was ready for anything. He yeah. was great. He so was. 
I met him in New York in 68. He was working for an advertising agency building sets. That's really? when I was sitting in front of Gem Spa on my suitcase with a sign that said, take me home around my neck. And he <laughs> did. <laughs> yeah. Where, where was he living? He and Diane were living on 10th Street and Avenue A. Okay, right. So hey. they took me in. I lived there for, for a while, quite a while. You were at St. Mark's Place. On 10th and A. Uh, yeah, it's a little east of uh, St. Mark's. Yeah. So did he come to New York? Did you come to New York at the same time as Marshall and Diane? No, he was living in New York. They were living in New York. No, I mean, come to San Francisco. I'm no, uh, no, they came later. I kept writing them saying, oh, you got to come out, you know. Right. And then um, they finally did. Hey, uh, we've got an interesting, we've got two uh, unanswered questions here from Patty Spaniak Davidson. What was Sylvester like? And from Brian Loma. Oh, my Sylvester's friend. coming up. So save that question because Sylvester is coming up in a little while and we can talk about him then. And Brian Loman from LA in LA, my old friend Brian and fellow artiste, he uh, wants to know what were rehearsals like? Do we have that coming up? <laughs> yeah, well, we have the whole, the whole show section is coming up. Okay. This is the house section. So. Okay. Now Link is in his bedroom and he's wearing a plastic mask. Oh, with... that is so Link. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, it took me forever to realize that. I, I didn't. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with his face there. That was his Madame New period, I think. Oh yes, yes. Anime Wong, right? And Madame New, he loved Madame New with all of her shoes. Oh, Madame New, yeah, the Dragon Lady. She was. Uh, and this is hibiscus in the house. Um, it's such a beautiful picture, but I love the the girdle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's such a good touch. And here, okay, we're coming to the show part. So here is the Palace Theater. This is where we performed. And it was at, it was across from the park. It was on Columbus and what? Columbus and Powell. 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 On Union, all uh, three way yeah. intersection. Right. To go with all the three ways. <laughs> and this this is Hollywood Babylon. There's the crowd. And here's a, a bigger look. This So this was the first show that drew an enormous crowd. And Sebastian told me that um, when they couldn't fit any more people in, he closed the door. And this guy his face got smashed against the window and he was holding a $50 bill and smashing it against the window. And Sebastian said, that's when he knew that it was a hit. <laughs> well, then we rented a Klieg light that night and yeah. uh, there was a Klieg light out, out front and Hibiscus was supposed to tap dance on top of a taxi cab. And there was a red carpet and we all, we all uh, uh, arrived in all these, um, Inez had a 1929 uh, car and- yeah. Packard, right? And Peter had a 38 Buick and we just kept, a, so they circle a block and kept bringing people and we'd all enter, you know? And it was pretty, but as far as rehearsals, I just was overlooking my material today. Hibiscus refused to come to rehearsals for Hollywood Babylon because Michael Kalman was supposed to be directing and he refused to have a director and so he came the night as jane mansfield and started changing the order of his routines there he is <laughs> saying the girl can't help it and a bunch of us like were his backup uh dancers well hibiscus's theater concept was anti-theater it was very much uh it was part of the New York tradition that was beginning in the underground theater with John Vaccaro, who had the theater of the ridiculous. And it, it was not about any rehearsal and there was no director. It was about starting and then seeing where it goes. And so Hibiscus had that vision and it was like a psychedelicized version of that kind of absurdist theater that was going on in New York. So I can understand why he didn't want Michael Kalman. <laughs> Rumi wanted, Rumi brought in Michael Kalman because he wanted, you know, his- Yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> he wanted their special things to go on, but Hibiscus's vision was much more uh, unbounded. Um, yeah, so he this he wanted, yeah, go ahead. he wanted to make us uh, 
really it was like early punks because we were sort of, you know how the early punk rockers played two or three chords and loud and unrehearsed and, and everything. That's kind of what we were only on stage. You know what I mean? Simplified. Yeah, exactly. Right. Under rehearsed and all also you could keep uh keep it open keep it spon extremely spontaneous instead of as an alternative to regular theater well i thought the first year was totally magic because yeah. we did create the magic on the stage we had the theme and everybody got dressed in their best possible everybody brought their a game to the stage and then you know because we were really tight as a group we would play off each other and um i loved it i thought it was the greatest thing ever because it was totally unrehearsed and and the outcome you never knew what was going to happen so the outcome was the magic uh, i thought it was fabulous so this is gone with the showboat do you remember the costumes scrambling i sewed half of them gone with the showboat to oklahoma that's the full <laughs> Yeah, and there is Karima and Linker in blackface. Oh, there you are on the side. Okay. Yeah, they. You now you have to explain that because in the woke culture, uh, it blackface for us was a parody. Right. A parody of satire. Right. A parody of something that you know was taken for granted. Taken for granted that it's not right. You know. Yeah, but it was like a takeoff on vaudeville, you know. It was a takeoff on vaudeville. It was a whole, what we did was like social commentary, really for, uh, and, and celebration of the music. And it was, it was a, a window to create a, a kind of revolution, a new kind of revolution, one that wasn't negative. Right. And we also wanted to piss people off. So oh, that yeah. was another aspect. Yeah. But yeah, we, we weren't very PC. We were not. Yeah. We were not consciously offending any African Americans. No, we yeah. had all, but we had. We had three, please, <laughs> and they were doing the same thing. Yeah. So here is Hibiscus playing Edith Piaf, and that's uh, Sandy in the back. I always loved Sandy, which was truly crazy. Oh, and, uh, oh. Yes, in a way. Yeah, in a great way, I thought, and a really, I was always inspired by the outfit. And uh, Sandy would go through periods of not speaking at all. So for her, the drag really was the expression. Um, let's see, and that's the same one. And then, see the guy in the mic, that's um, Rick Elfman, who I brought home one day and one night and, uh, he jumped into the show. He was in, he's in several shows. Um, and then he went to Paris and formed his own theater group called the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. And then he came back to LA in, I think about 76 or 77. And uh, he wanted to, you know, put it together, but instead he did a film called the uh, Forbidden Zone. And his brother, um, the other Elfman uh, wanted to form a band. And so he gave him the name Oingo Boingo. So that's how Oingo Boingo began. And now this is the, the I've always wondered what is that background? I never knew where that came from, Scrumbly. It's so gorgeous. It was really magical. It had, it had a fairy and, oh, it was just like the greatest, this is, the show was called Fairy Tale Extravaganza, and that backdrop was so beautiful. Do you remember where that came from? I never knew. It. We, we never saw it again. No, I can't even remember it being there. Oh, probably. I, I thought it was great. Yeah. <laughs> so, and here's Sylvester. Was this the first show that Sylvester was in, Scrumbly? Um, you know, I, I have trouble remembering what it actually was. He auditioned with Mickey Mouse, M I C K E Y, and then he was in that very next show. And I probably was around that time, the fairy tale extravaganza. Yeah. But so here he is. This is one another Mary Ellen Mark picture. This was the the studio shoot that we did, and uh, there's Sylvester with his gorgeous afro. 
And here he is. This is how Sylvester really saw himself. And he was able to, he was able to realize that in the Cockettes. And um, this is a photo that he had like a professional portrait photographer take this photo. And he would, and it says 1925, and he would sign it, Miss Ruby Blue. And then that was like his headshot or, you know, it was a whole, he was as much into the vintage as we were. And I mean, we wanted to place ourselves back in the time, you know, we wanted to be back in time. And um, here he is performing. And I remember when he and Peter Minton went, when we did Ross Alley, um, Peter Minton and, and Sylvester went into the nightclub in Ross Alley. There was a little Chinese nightclub. Rickshaw. Rickshaw. And they said, oh, yeah. <laughs> the what? The called what? Rickshaw bar. <laughs> the rickshaw bar. Yeah. Oh, my God. And they, in drag, and they played, and we all came in in our, you know, Chinese Pearls Over Shanghai drag and sat there, and no one else was in the bar. So, I mean, as far as that went, I felt like we were totally transported at that moment. We had a, a little time capsule entertainment in the rickshaw bar. So this is hibiscus and all this finery. Nikki put that together. We did a photo shoot in the park. So I took that picture. I mean, so Sylvester, not, not Sylvester. What did I say? Uh, no, I said Nikki did his makeup and the and the drag and everything. So here's Peter Minton in the lobby of the palace. Is that a wig? Has he got a wig on there? No, that was his hair. He had long hair. Oh, but it's sort of curled. I don't know, it looked looked different. Looks like those playing cards where it curls up at the very end, you know, the page. Oh, right. That's right. what it does. I have wavy hair like that too when it gets long. So here's Peter Minton. This is also from the, the Mary Ellen Mark shoot. And this is um, the Ross Alley in the Canton flower shop. I mean, it looks like an old picture. And here we are, the first tinsel tarts. This was, um, and that's Wally with everything on the top and uh, nothing on the bottom. Oh, was that a costume malfunction? <laughs> Crumbly, let's play, so you want to play some music? Uh, what do you want? You want background or forward? You want it? You Either, want it? you choose. Or something? Uh, yeah. You know, let's, uh, we've been looking at Pearls Over Shanghai. Well, uh, that's the Jewels of Paris. If you want no, me this to... is the uh, Paris Follies. Yes. And yeah, the... this was the first okay. French show. The song was called The Jewels of Paris. Okay. You want to that... play that? Uh, but no, let's, let's do, uh, Shanghai. The okay. Now Shanghai was was not. Now Shanghai was a takeoff on showing the the silliness of uh, of stereotypes of of all the different people that lived in Shanghai during the nineteen thirties. Uh, well, I know it. Shanghai. Shanghai, you'll be sitting pretty when you stroll the streets with a Chinese cutie or a Russian beauty. Shanghai, you'll be doing duty on opium or chop suey. You'll be praying that you'll never leave it. Old Sent Town by its river of dreams. Lead me to it, evil. Poppies and commerce, honor. Satin and hunger, heaven. Scheming 
fabulous. That show was totally my favorite. It was so much fun. Oh my God. And every time we did it, we did it differently. Link kept adding stuff. It was, oh, that yeah. was- Oh, there was a new third act every time we did the show. <laughs> yeah. Lyrics by Link, music by me. That's right. So, so this is Daniel with an outfit from the MGM uh, hall, you know, the MGM sale. Yeah. Uh, came to, yeah, this is like a showgirl, a Las Vegas showgirl outfit. Uh, and so that's the finale for Tinsel Tarts. <laughs> and this is Les Ghouls. Mark. Here's Daniel in Les Ghouls. Oh, yeah, that was the two brides of Frankenstein, right? And before that, Markel, one of the other biological women in the group, she always wore. Yeah. Her pink velvet strap on. Yeah. Right. Dick and balls, right. She was fabulous. She was a beatnik. Yeah. Markel was, oh, a poet, a beat poet. There's Gary Cherry. Oh, yeah. Here's Reggie, right? Yeah, she's next to Reggie, and Prissy is behind. And I'm behind and, Markel. Uh, right. Yeah. Now, I made those those bibs. Those bibs, yay. Yeah, I made those. I and still the, got mine. <laughs> oh, no, you do? Really? Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Does it still have the bow on it and everything? Um, I have the bow, but it came off, you know. <laughs> oh my God. And cuffs. See the cuffs. <laughs> here's Lake Ghouls, and that's Daniel. Um, so here's Nikki making Reggie up. And so this was uh, the shoot that we did for the Paper Doll book. This was right before we went to New York. And so there's Link in his Romanian Rhapsody outfit, which I thought was just too much. <laughs> and there you are. You want to talk about that, Pam? That little Never get up there. Really. Yeah. Well, I love what you have on your head. It looks great. Yeah, that white fox was beautiful in its day. Yeah. And what's in the bag there? Absolutely no. no idea. In shock. It's a great picture, yeah. Oh, and there's there's my little sunglasses with the <laughs> smoking. We were both smoking. We were all I smoking. I mean, we were all smoking. I know. Okay, this is at the airport, and uh, there is Lyndon in the outfit that is just superb, and John Rothermill, and here is Sylvester. This um, is New York, right? This is on the way to New York. This is on the 747. And he found that shirt because uh, we had this, I don't know, we were having, we were together at the house and um, putting on the Ritz was on the, on the record player. And uh, we just decided we were the Ritz family going to New York. So we all had Ritz names. And um, I don't even remember. I mean, we, we really, it was like a joke, but Krima took it seriously because well, he, didn't he wanted want to, to get kill. rid of his old name, Big Daryl. Yeah, he didn't anymore. want to be Big Daryl anymore. Right. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, he kept Krima Ritz. Yeah. So, there, and yeah. It's time to talk about uh, a little more about rehearsals. We got one more question on that. Okay. Uh, okay, is this a good time? Okay, so uh, Brian wants to know. Uh, was there a loose storyline that you followed or was it a series of vignettes connected by theme? And the answer is both. Mostly, most all the shows were uh, vignettes connected by a theme. Uh, the French show, the first ones of the French show, the Halloween show, the 50s show, Gone with the Showboat to Oklahoma. Hollywood Babylon. The way that the, they were placed was an almost kind of zen, you know, well, it feels like the right place to put to put the next number, uh, right. you know, and and intuitive. Martin uh, Link wrote one, one big show, Pearls of Shanghai, that had a whole script, plot, everything, worked just like a regular musical, and also Martin uh, did a piece called Hot Greeks, that was a play with the same thing based on Lysistrata, and he also wrote uh, the. Some people call it post coquettes with Vice Palace, and it was based on Edgar Allan's Poe. Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Mask of the Red Death meets Federico Fellini. 
But until Shanghai, there really was no script. It was like a three page outline, maybe, you know. Yeah. yeah. And songs, you know, I yeah. mean, Peter Minton and Sylvester and Scrumbly would put in songs where, where, and people would, people would choose to do the songs, say, oh, I want to do that song. I want to do that one. And, and so this is uh, Lyndon on the airplane with his complete outfit, which I think is really fabulous. Um, so that thing on his head, it's like African plus 40s turban. I mean, I just, I think it's a gorgeous outfit. It's, it's so stunning. I think uh, and here is the round. Time yeah. Hibiscus ever, he choreographed a triple um, header. He, uh, three numbers to close the show of Hollywood Babylon was cap, um, We're in the Money, Happy Trails to You with Brent playing uh, Dale, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and they stood up on a riser and then it went into uh, the spokes of a wagon wheel happy trails and we were in threes and spokes of a wagon wheel turning round and round on the stage happy trails to you was the, the end and people loved it and it was the only and time in rodeo uh, radio rodeo no this was at the end of Hollywood Babylon there was, oh okay yeah there was a, a three uh three production numbers all tied together. It's the first time I ever knew Hibiscus to attempt anything so, you know. And you would, join, you would be asked to join somebody's number. They said, would you like to be in my number? And you'd gather the people to do the supporting things or who wants to be in this number? Oh yeah, great, so. Well, except Hibiscus, he kind of joined any number he wanted. Right. Just jumped out there on stage, you know. Oh, tell about the zebra thing with this officer. <laughs> you know, oh, please. He appeared in the zebra head. Uh, that was the uh, first. Was show. Behind Sylvester, wasn't Sylvester right. singing? Right. He would dance behind Sylvester, right? But at first, he'd been out there several times already with this big zebra head. This was uh, <laughs> the Coquette du Paris, and. Uh, but then Sylvester was in the middle of one of his big solos where Sylvester was very finite. He planned everything. He knew just exactly what he was doing. Uh, most of us didn't. We just experimented. But Sylvester was aware of every detail. So he was pissed when it happened. Of course, he didn't let it on. But the next day in the meeting that we had about the show, then Sylvester goes, and then the zebra comes out again. <laughs> I know. Well, Sylvester had a plan. I mean, we an agenda. So yeah, we, yeah, he had an he, yeah, he had a destiny for God's sakes. Oh yeah. yeah he knew he was going to have a career, but I mean, he really he he formulated himself in the Cockettes because um, yeah. recently they've shown these interviews, and in one, uh, it was you know he performed on stage. It was a TV show, and. Um, whoever was the host came on and afterwards asked him, cause he was in, in a drag of a gorgeous drag. And uh, the, the host said, well, now what are you? And he said, I'm Sylvester. And I thought, yeah, you know, that materialized in the Cockettes cause you know, there was no specificity, no gender, you know, we were whatever. So oh, yeah. yeah. Fluid. So this is Tinsel Tarts in New York. And uh, this was the set, I thought the set, and this had to be done. I mean, we did this in days because, um, you know, the stage was so much bigger at the Anderson Theater. So there was a big champagne glass and this uh, saran wrap or, you know, cellophane that came out like pouring. It was very Art Deco. Here's another picture. So you can see the champagne glass and the set designer, the producer for the film, The Boyfriend, sent the set, uh, the production designer and the set dresser to the show to say that he wanted the, uh, the sets for the boyfriend to be like this. So that was our early influence there. Don Flowers did a lot of that, didn't he? Oh, he did the whole thing. Absolutely. He had, you helped him. Well, I was there as crew, but it, John was the designer of the, of the set, yeah. God, is that Angels of Light or us? No, no. This oh. is uh, I don't. This is a Shanghai uh, outfit, and I think this was when we came back and did it 
Awesome. in San Francisco uh, one last time because this is a, it's a, I think it's a Clay Gertie's picture, but he wasn't in New York. So this is Dusty Dawn and Wally. I mean, when we got back from New York, you know, our, our drag was very honed because we had done it. You know, we had, we were, we were so well honed when we came back from New York because we did it for weeks and what, like three, four shows a week or something like that? Six. Six yeah. shows a week. There you go, man. We were, we got professional. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Tinsel Tarts with, see, this is another thing. This was like a Klaus Oldenburg uh, influence doing these big champagne glasses. Uh, I mean, John and I would talk art theory all the time. So we used a lot of cardboard. Yeah. Oh, major. Yeah. And this is you, Scrumbly. This is the Shanghai in San Francisco, the last one, because this is a Roger Anderson shot. No, he was in New York, actually. Roger Anderson was? Yeah, he took the, a lot of pictures in New York. But yeah, he did. This might have been the last production in San Francisco. Yeah. Nikki, Nikki did my makeup, and then I just, the first night, and then I imitated it. I recreated it. Incredible that you were able to recreate it. Yeah, it's... Well, Nikki's makeup was so extravagant. So, okay, this is the the finale of Tinsel Tarts in New York and uh, Link, because there were so many cockroaches in the uh, Albert Hotel. <laughs> the Albert Hotel. And he decided to be a big cockroach. That's a cockroach <laughs> outfit and he's singing La Cucaracha. And the Anderson had like uh, some kind of a elevated or something that, you know, he was able to come up from the basement <laughs> yeah. uh, with this outfit on. Do you remember that? It's like a trap door. It, it, yeah, it was a trap door, yeah, with an incline, I think. And then he was able to come up. I think Lyndon used that too for Hayride to Havana. He used that. Oh, did door. he? Yeah. Well, that but might this was in New York, I remember. And one number might have slid right into the next. Yeah. Right. And this is Lyndon backstage. I thought this was a particularly good picture. And what the hell is all that hair, man? Um, <laughs> talk about backstage. Yeah, the action really happened backstage. Oh my God. And this is, okay, so when we got to New York, things got glamorous. And so this is a Gilles Lorraine of uh, the cover of Zoom. And it had like, people from New York, some of the New York underground and cockettes uh, all dressed up fabulous. And Gilles Lorraine said after this came out and he did his book called Idols, uh, Zoom Magazine, all the advertisers left when this came out. And um, Gilles got death threats after Idols, his book Idols came out. Wow. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, it was that far forward. It was nobody. Wow. Yeah, people got really annoyed. I mean, you know, the advertisers pulled out of that magazine, so. And this is this Peter Hugar shoot. So there you are, Scrumbly. And that's Tommy Neese, right? Tommy and he Neese, was Peter man. Mitten's boyfriend, right? Oh, he yes, did the he lighting? The light man. Okay. Love your dress, Scrumbly. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there you are. This is a fabulous outfit, Pam. It's really good. I was trying to disguise my pregnant belly. So I, you know, I look like a potted plant with these leaves coming up from, you know. Oh, I love it. I mean, it's, nobody even does something so fabulous now. Are you kidding? And so th this is my ultra glam outfit with. Uh, you were so great with veils. I mean, nobody can yeah. work a veil like you can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I loved them. That was on the I, I love this shot. Wow. Reggie and Goldie. I mean, this is a great shot. That is. So then afterwards, we went down Times Square. We had a little bit of fun on Times Square. That was crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. Because, you know, the Peter Hujar shoot lasted all day and into the night. I mean, he shot volumes of film. Like there's so much film of this shoot. And so we were so happy <laughs> when we left, we were so thrilled. And we and then we came walking down the street in drag in Times Square. And we went into Playland and we met 
you know, a denizen of Times Square, this guy. You could see Nikki really likes this guy. He's very entertained by him. And there's pictures on the contact sheet that he followed us out and, you know, stayed with us for quite a while. And here's John getting out of uh, a taxi. <laughs> I love that look. <laughs> He he always wanted to look like like Weimar Germany, you know. So yes. oh, that yeah. hat, that was his Dietrich Weimar Germany look. Exactly. Yeah. So this is Max's, you two guys at Max's. This must have been after the shoot because you have the same gear on. And so this is also this is, uh, <laughs> Anton Parrish. <laughs> and we're at Max's, and John is a little bit stoned, maybe. <laughs> Who's talking that? It looks like Johnny. What? Johnny? Oh, what? Yeah, it looks like no, Johnny. No, it's Link, Link and me. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay, it's Link. Oh, okay. It's... <laughs> yeah, it's Link and his famous tongue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And so this is at Robert Rauschenberg's, and... Uh, I'm just a little bit stoned there. Oh yeah. yeah. He gave us some money to get through. He did. He oh, paid. Prima was upset because it was only a thousand dollars. He says it could have been ten thousand uh, dollars. <laughs> never enough for Crema. <laughs> Look yeah, no. Uh, he he gave us all like a week's worth of uh, money to do the show. And this is too, this is little, but this is Diana Freeland and you. Do you remember talking to her, Pam? Yeah, yeah. But I what didn't did realize afterwards when everyone goes, oh my God, there's a picture of you with Diana Vreeland. I really had no idea who she really was. Oh my you God, know, really? At, at the time. You could see John Rothermill knows who she is. Because yeah. in every picture, he's, he's next to her. He was glued to her. <laughs> And I found that outfit in a dumpster, you know, and she, and she loved it. <laughs> well, you know, Tom Judd is asking, uh, did we meet Andy Warhol in New York City? Well, Pam did later on, but I. Well, I met Andy Warhol early when I was when I was in high school. I used to go to New York and I met him and but, Gerard Manega, the whole entourage at a party. But, and then I went to his loft, but. Hung out with Taylor Mead and. Uh, yeah. Mario and uh, Hollywood Lawn and well Mario Montez Jackie when, Curtis when we were hanging out with I remember yeah. hanging out with Jackie Curtis I didn't hang out with Warhol though but you know oh, he, he, he didn't make many appearances no, no no but when we all went back to New York Pam we worked with them in the Palm Casino Review uh, right. all the, all the yeah. underground yeah. in uh, Manhattan was, were, you know, we were all in the Palm Casino. Mario movie. Montez. Oh, Mario Montez was fabulous. Yeah. So this is, I think this is the last Shanghai that was in San Francisco. And there's Inez. God, Inez, Inez looks so young. Sailor, as a sailor, the sailor guy. He was captured. And so this is, this is Journey to the Center of Your, I, you know, I couldn't find that picture where, uh, it's in the book but I couldn't locate it among the files of uh, Divine in the crab outfit, but uh, yeah. I don't think, I don't know if there is one. I've got, I've got two know, of them. Clay Gertie's took uh, a Susie, picture. Susie Cream Cheese uh, Su uh, took some of that show. I've got oh, really? black and white, yeah. Well, the one that, that I have in the book is, is Clay's shot and he had various shots of her and we colorized it to be red because it was a black and white picture, but it, it shows the, the giant tentacles, you know, mm -hmm. to be the crab, to sing, a crab on your anus means you're loved. And nobody wanted to sing it, do you remember that? Because it was when we came back from New York, all the queens were too hoity-toity and they, oh, I don't want to sing that song. That's beneath me to sing that song. And then Divine came along and said, oh yeah. And then it brought down the house and they were all jealous. Oh, let's hear it, yeah. Your piano keeps cutting in and out. Oh, uh, I think we have to be quiet. So Scrumbly, yeah, play something. Play, do you remember from Uranus? Have time? Yeah, we do. 
Quite a couple of minutes. Song. Oh, a crab on Uranus. Though some folks think it's heinous and something to be get rid of. Uh, <laughs> no, I have to go get the music. Anyway, you get the idea. Oh, I love it. A crab on Uranus means you're loved. And this is Hot Greeks. Yeah, this was our 1940s, or Martin Warman who wrote it. This was a night, tribute to 1940s college musicals. So this is sort of a set doubly in Athens, Ohio, and Athens, Greece. Oh, okay. I remember I was a cheerleader. You were. Yeah, I was a cheerleader. And you, told a filthy joke. You told about how you got into the baths. Oh, don't. Yeah. <laughs> It's too filthy. And, then, uh, and and John Flowers had this character where he spoke totally in rhyme all the time. What's, yeah. what's that? Sh what are you wearing, Sharon? Yeah, yeah. Sue, Sue, you're a mess, Bess. And he made the, all of that up himself. So we might have had a script, but we padded our parts. <laughs> yeah. I think John talked like that for about two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He kept it going. Yeah. So that's it. So yeah, look at the questions because we uh, we have time. So take Natalie Crew wants to know. Uh, she says she actually adores all the pictures, Scrumbly's music and the convo. Of course, thank you all for sharing these amazing pictures and memories. Are there cast albums from any of the shows? Yes, there. There's several. Um, that most of the albums are from Thrill Peddler's recreations of the Cockettes shows. And and by the way, you should all should all know there's the famous movie, the award winning documentary called The Cockettes that came out in two thousand three. Uh, it streams for free on Canopy. Right. The library it streaming. Two thousand two, because that's when we went to Sundance. Right. right two thousand two. Anyway. It's credited as 2003. And then um, there are uh, cast albums uh, from Thrill Peddlers Productions around, it started uh, 2010 up to 2014. There's Pearls Over Shanghai, there's Hot Greeks, there's uh, Vice Palace, there's those three. And there are videos out on YouTube on Mr. Wa on his site, Mr. Wa. Mr. M I S T E R W A. And that's of the Thrill Peddlers. And that's of all the Thrill Peddlers recreations of the Cockettes shows. Fantastic. So, Are there any other questions? Uh, let's see. Let's see what he. Well, the first one, uh, no, here's up at the top Brenda Moreno. She says, I feel like I'm eavesdropping on three longtime friends going through old pictures. That one of them just came across again in the attic. This is just the best. It makes me wish I was just a baby. I wasn't just a baby at the time. Well, hi, Brenda. <laughs> she was a baby. Uh, Tom, Tom Judd wants to know, uh, when did we notice the rents were going, were getting obscenely high in San Francisco? Well, Fayette yeah. Not back then. <laughs> no. Yeah, we, we, I mean, um, I went to, after, um, after we stopped doing shows, I went to uh, Seattle because Tomato wanted me to play with the Wiz Kids in Seattle. Tomato Duplenty started in the Cockettes. He, he was in the first couple of shows and then he went to Seattle and he formed the Wiz Kids and they did shows uh, in this club called the sub room which was in the basement of the smith tower this gorgeous victorian building and they did shows every weekend so they were fast and furious so second, i was there for se, second say what second and yesler i'll never forget the address oh wow wow okay <laughs> yeah so i mean i was there for uh months and then um I kept telling Tomato that the underground theater people in New York wanted us to come back and play with them. So we, the two of us decided to go to New York. So we went there in the winter of 72 
and we rented <laughs> we rented a um, a flat in a tenement that was a city owned building. And we rented these two apartments that were at, at the end of the hall. And one was on one side and one was on the other. And they were $50 a month. And so we broke through the connecting wall and we never made like a door out of it. We just hung a curtain over it, of course. And so Tomato and I were on one side and then Screaming Orchids and one of the other Whiz Kids was on the other side. Um, and we started performing and uh, we did we did this show called There's Egypt in Your Dreamy Eyes and some of the John Waters people were in it. Um, and then this was right on the Bowery. We were on second and Bowery and Tomato and I, you know, we would walk around and of course and, and go wherever. And right, we were walking down the Bowery and there it was Hilly's bar and it had closed down because Hilly would never pay his taxes. You know, he was such a radical. And so just like in his movie, he was out there sweeping the street and we started talking to him and he said he was changing uh, to be a different bar. So they were just about to hang up the canopy that was CBGB's and Omfug. And so he had us come in and we looked in and there at the end of the bar, it was like a railroad car bar with the, the bar on one side, beautiful old bar, and all these bar signs, like it must have been two dozen bar signs all across where the bar was. And then at the end, it had this little stage. It was perfect. We said, fabulous. And in the back was this big blow up of a Victorian uh, performer in a corset. I remember that. It's in every early picture of uh, performing at CBGB's. So we started doing shows there uh, and we did um, Savage Voodoo Nuns several times there. And by that time, uh, so by now we're moving into the spring of 73. And by that time, Pam, you came and John. And John Flowers and you did Love yeah. Dames Die Hard. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. We did Love Dames Die Hard at the Club 82. Yeah, so. Um, he played Esther the, Williams understudy. <laughs> <laughs> right, and and I played a stunt girl who rode on the wing of an airplane. Oh, and what was her name? Um, Betty, it was Betty something. Um, oh, I can't remember, but you know, I in my trunks, which I still had, I actually found the outfit. Nikki oh, made me this outfit. You know, Nikki, because by that time Nikki came too, and he would, I would be, sleeping because you know we would have to take speed like three days before the show to do the outfits and then I would you know of course stay up so I was napping and he was measuring me while I was asleep and <laughs> he made this jumpsuit it was like orange stretch uh satin and it had jawed furs and it had a big silver mesh collar that oh it was just and I had a helmet and goggles and yeah, so I was the stunt girl on an airplane for Love Dames Die Hard. Um, but then the band started playing at CBGB's and that's how we met the Ramones, you remember? So we were doing Savage Voodoo Nuns and they were opening for us and Gorilla Rose, he went to the theater. He said, I'm gonna go see who this act is because they were having a sound check. And he came, by that time we were living in the loft, you, me and John and Arturo, Arturo Vega, Miguel, and Jaime. Manuel living, and, right. Yeah. Right. And they were living below us and we had become tight with them. And uh, so Gorilla Rose came home and said, you will not believe this band. And so that's how we met the Ramones and uh, Dee Dee, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to go out with, it's, it's almost time to leave. Uh, okay. Out with, I've got a, uh, YouTube up, not a YouTube, but my own video of uh, Midnight Manhattan. Yay. Ice Palace. Is it Fabulous. That? that gives us, up, takes us out at about, in about three minutes. Or we Fantastic. can get that. Yeah, I, I'm skipping the verse and I'll share screen if you want. Definitely. You share screen with other participants. Oh, you have to unshare your screen first. Okay. Oh, there. There you go. And then I'll go to here. You get that? Yes. Okay. The wig. 
This is from 2012. Crab on your Uranus comes after that one, but it's about time to end. <laughs> okay, I'm typing uh, for a signed copy. Wow. What, uh, what a show. What, uh, what an event, you guys. Um, <laughs> I feel like we could go on for another hour, hour and a half, two, two and a half hours. But um, there's so many stories. There's, I feel like we just scratched the surface we of the car just the um, surface. So, you know, uh, everybody know, um, you know, Pam's book might be out of print, but you can definitely find copies of it online. Uh, Fayette's book right here, The Cockettes. It's available right now in every indie bookstore. Uh, if it isn't there, tell them to order the book. If you can't find it that way, go to bookshop.org and find it on Liquid's. Uh, and I also have a site for signed copies. That's right. Well, uh, that's right. Fayettehauser.com, right? No, but uh, the sales site for the book is thecockets.net. Oh, that's right. That's right. The co There's a lot of Cockettes websites out there. I'm not yeah. it's about it. Believe me, it's the most beautiful thing you've seen. Yeah. It's, it's visually exquisite. It's All really the pictures are in it plus more. So, and John and a Waters lot of text writes has... an introduction. There's all kinds of stuff in it. Um, gosh, you guys, I wish I uh, was older and moved to San Francisco earlier, but um, <laughs> we uh, had a good time. Yeah, no, that's uh, it's a, a, a rarity. It's a little thing of the burying history that I'm so glad is more people are learning about it now because you know it was uh, at, at a certain point in time people weren't aware of it anymore. So. Thank God there was a documentary that was made, and now uh, both of you have done books, and um, 
uh, it's great. It's just a, um, what a what a profound thing you guys did, high on acid in your early twenties. Right. <laughs> Very cool. And uh, Scrumbly, thank you for, for for playing music and finding that video tonight. Really adds a lot. It's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, it sounds like uh, it was really fun. So. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Uh, this streamed live on Facebook, so you, uh, I'll send you all the link. If uh, anybody's watching here tonight, go to the Liquid Facebook page, and it'll be on our YouTube page uh, in another day or so. So, sharing to the world. Um, great. Uh, I know, you know, we we have no time left, but um, I just wanted. Uh, I'm so glad this event came together. I was I was like pushing for it, and I I knew that. Thanks, it Jack. So. Thank you so much, Jack. Yeah. No, it was, it's awesome. Thanks for all your help. It's awesome. <laughs> and we uh, we figured out the slides look beautiful, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, it worked God. out. It now you can find out. us another $135 six room flat. We'll take it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. God. My yeah, we lived in San Francisco when they were giving out the last good time. The, the six There's room no Victorian flat. Yeah. $135. Yeah, now, now you're just irritating people who moved here later. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you all again so much to carcats.net for all the information. And uh, Liquid continues through uh, October 24th at liquid.org. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Jack. Bye.